Hi everybody and welcome to this revision video on sleep hygiene as part of the psychological health and well-being topic for stage 2 psychology. Let's get started. So sleep hygiene are a series of sleep habits that can improve your ability to fall and stay asleep more effectively. So in other words, the things in our behavioural control to improve our sleep quality and quantity and ensure that we go through our sleep cycles correctly and get enough slow wave restorative sleep, like I've talked about in previous videos. So it's very important to maintain overall health and wellbeing by getting enough sleep. And these are different strategies that we can do that are within our control to ensure that our sleep hygiene is at a healthy level. So let's go through them. So keeping a consistent sleep schedule is really important. So getting up at the same time each day, give or take half an hour and going to bed at the same time each day, again, give or take half an hour, including weekends. I understand this can be quite difficult, but making sleep a priority, especially this year, uh, if you want to do that and you're serious about that, this is the number one recommendation. So making sure that you have a consistent get up and go to, time, uh, go to bed uh, time, give or take half an hour, including the weekends. So also setting a bedtime early enough for you to get at least eight to 10 hours sleep. So if again, getting you know nine hours is what you're aiming to do, like I nag you all about all the time, making sure that you actually go to bed early enough for that to happen. So if you have to get up at 6.30 in the morning, obviously going to bed uh, early enough that you can still get nine hours is obviously good hygiene practice. Now, don't go to sleep unless you, or don't go to bed, I should say, unless you are sleepy. So if you're wide awake, it's actually not a good idea to get into bed and try and get to sleep. Otherwise, you're going to lie there for a long period of time, often hours, and then stress about the fact that you're not asleep. That's actually going to make the problem worse. So what you should do is get up or don't go to bed at all if you're, you know, wide awake. Uh, or if you do go to bed and you're not falling asleep after about 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes, as I've said there at the most, get up, do something else. All right, do another activity. Uh, without a lot of light all right don't go on your phone don't watch tv don't go on your laptop as tempting as it is that's the worst thing you can do or one of the worst things you can do because again you're sending light to your uh, retinas which is sending a message to your pineal gland through your scn that it's actually time to be awake so if you can't fall asleep after about 20 minutes at the most get up do something else so read a book you know clean something organize something until you are sleepy enough that you're confident that you will fall asleep if we lie awake in bed, stressing that we're not asleep, then we're going to start to associate our bed with being awake rather than asleep. So it's good to then establish a bedtime routine. All right, so devices away at 9.30, brush your teeth, uh, get a drink of water, read a book, lights off at 10 or something like that. It doesn't have to be exactly what I say, but something that's similar to this. Our brains and our bodies love consistency and especially our circadian rhythms. So psychologically, as well as biologically, our um, bodies and brains will get used to this routine and make sleep onset and sleep quality far more likely. Now, only use your bed for sleep and sex. It's not a good idea to use your bed for anything else. So don't do homework in bed or talk on the phone or you know, watch movies in bed and things like that. Only use your bed for sleep and sex. What we will tend to do if we you know, use the bed for other things like homework or stressing is associate the bed and bedroom with those things rather than sleep. So only use your bed for those two reasons. If you can, avoid sleeping other places that are not your bed. So if you need to have a nap or you fall asleep somewhere else, like an armchair or a couch, that can actually lead to sleep deprivation because, again, our brain will make associations that we should be sleeping somewhere else other than our own bed. So where possible, try and sleep, even if it's naps, in your own bed and not other places. All right, some more sleep hygiene uh, habits that are recommended. Make your room quiet and relaxing. So that's obviously subjective depending on each individual's needs. So making sure the room is at a comfortable, cool temperature is pretty universal. So we tend to sleep better in winter because our body temperature drops naturally in winter anyway. Um, and it's a lot easier to sleep in winter because of the lack of light that's present. We tend to struggle to sleep more so in summer because it's hot. So our body temperature remains high when our body temperature should be obviously going lower. So making sure that you're able to have a fan or put the AC on, you know, in advance will obviously be a good sleep hygiene technique as well. 
So I'm like that. I have to have a fan on even if it's the, in the dead of winter. I need a cool breeze all right, in order for me to fall asleep. So you do you. You do what works for you. All right, limit, limit exposure to bright light in the evenings. I've already explained at length why this is the case. So just avoid lights in the late evenings, uh, especially um, blue lights. So blue lights from your phone, your laptop, you know, an iPad, things like that. All right, so make sure that you're turning off your electronic devices at least 30 minutes before bedtime. An hour is more ideal, though. Now, don't eat a large meal before bedtime, all right? If you're really hungry and you know that's going to keep you awake, you can eat a light, healthy snack that's easy to digest. If we have a huge meal before trying to get to sleep, our digestive circadian rhythm will be competing with our sleep circadian rhythm and it won't know what to do. Often people will fall asleep, yes, but because there's a lot of other processes going on in digesting food, it will stress the body out because digesting food actually takes a lot of energy and it may mean that you don't get a very good quality sleep because, again, the body is too energized to reach those deeper stages of sleep. So where possible, avoid a very large meal before bedtime. It's also a good idea to exercise regularly and maintain a healthy diet. So if we keep all of our other circadian rhythms healthy, so our you know, cardiovascular disease and our digestive system healthy and our immune system healthy by, you know, exercising regularly and eating well, then our sleep-wake circadian rhythm will also um, benefit from that. So if we keep our other circadian rhythms happy, it'll keep our sleep-wake cycle happy. All right, avoid consuming caffeine in the afternoon or evening. One caffeinated drink lasts four hours in our system. So I'm not saying don't have caffeine at all. So you can have your coffee or your tea or your soft drink, you know, in the morning or very, very early afternoon. But after about three o'clock, you should avoid caffeine altogether because it may affect your ability to fall asleep later because it arouses the body too much. That coupled with often the amount of high levels of sugar in caffeinated drinks also doesn't help. Now, avoid consuming alcohol before bedtime. A lot of people ask me, hang on, doesn't alcohol actually help you fall asleep? It can allow you to fall asleep quickly because it is a depressant, but alcohol actually disrupts or interrupts the natural sleep-wake circadian rhythm. So even though someone may fall asleep very, very quickly after consuming alcohol, they're not going to get slow wave sleep because alcohol interrupts the process. So often if someone has had a big night, for example, they're not going to really feel all that great the next day, not only because they're hungover, but because they haven't actually gotten slow wave sleep or restorative sleep. So avoid consuming alcohol before bedtime. And the last strategy is to reduce your fluid intake before bedtime. Now, what I mean by this is don't scull a litre or two of water right before bed. Obviously, you're going to need to go to the toilet very, very quickly after that, and that may keep you awake. So if you need just a, you know, a little bit of a drink, that's fine, so a glass of water. But try not to drink too much before bedtime because, again, uh, it'll wake you up in terms of needing to go to the toilet, and that may interrupt your four to six, four to six sleep cycles. Another one that's not on there that I recommend is having a shower or a bath 90 minutes before bed. This helps to prompt our body temperature to increase slightly. And then when we get out of the shower or the bath, our body temperature will drop. And that often kick starts the rest of our circadian rhythm and the rest of our sleep-wake cycle to kick into gear. And typically more uh, melatonin is released because of that jump start, as I like to call it, of the shower or the um, bath before bed. So these are the main recommended sleep hygiene practices that can inc uh, increase your sleep quality and quantity. So I hope you found this useful. And as always, if you have any questions, let me know.